you know, Friday was arguably one of the best days the Mets had had in years. I mean, and without recency bias, right? Like that was to have a sweep of a doubleheader and the news that Steve Cohen got the exclusive rights to buy the Mets, which we've all jumped the gun with this before. Right. But do you think it's safe to say that this is a done deal at this point? Like what else could stop it? The owners rejecting him? Because I'm... I am still in this cautious, optimistic mode with this because I remember the first time that I heard that he was going to buy the Mets and that weird deal with the Wilpons still having control for five years. I was over the moon with that. Then I got crushed. And then this whole bidding process came in and I got excited again. Now I'm super excited about it, but I don't want to go too far because I feel like they still could be hangups, you know? I don't think so. I mean, the fact that you had the A-Rod and Jennifer Lopez group back out, um, I understand that they have to do their investigation and and all their due diligence. But I do think at this point it is going to be his team. I mean, he's got the most money. He put up the most money in the offer. They will have the exclusive negotiating period. Could something happen? I suppose. We've seen all those newspapers that say, you know, the Wilpons hate the guy. (laughs) So I guess it's possible. right? Right, Jeff. Is it possible? Yes. Do I think it's likely? I don't. I think at the end of the day, he will become the next Met owner. Because look look at it this way. Baseball wants him to be the Met owner from the standpoint of, you know, player movement and contracts and driving up salaries and stuff like that. And you certainly think that's the type of owner he'll be. So I do think it will will get done. Uh, And you're right. Friday was quite the day. You know, when you looked at the two wins and then this, you know, you wake up Saturday. I was going through the Twitter stuff on Saturday morning. You know, I kind of figured it'd be like it was when I went to bed Friday night. It was, I mean, over the moon for people. I mean, people are fired up, and rightly so, and then the next three games happen. Um, But I think for you going forward, this is what you wanted the whole time, and I think you are going to get exactly what you want. Yeah, and and see, you said one thing, though, that is confusing to me about the driving up the salaries. So you would think, like, the Players Association would love the driving up of the, the salaries. Owners, perhaps not. That's a very good point. I'm thinking so, more baseball, it's good for the players. That's true. That's a very good point. And, and, and who knows? And this is one of these misconceptions that just drives me insane about an owner that likes to spend money. It's not about just the free agent class from year to year. It's about everything. It's about retaining the players your homegrown players, so you don't have to worry about those guys going away. Like, for example, I mean, Zach Wheeler is someone that we understood that he was not as good a few years ago when the Mets could have bought out his arbitration years and and had him under control for a longer time and maybe gotten a discount on it. Maybe that's why they didn't do it. But that type of situation with an owner like Steve Cohen's like, you know, I see enough potential in him. Let's go ahead and do this and not worry about the money and let's go ahead and sign the guy as opposed to waiting until free agency and then you see he signs a $100 million deal with a team within the division. It's that type of stuff. Or when you go into an offseason and you address a couple of needs and instead of the owner saying, all right, that's it, we're putting a cap on this thing, you someone else is available you didn't expect to be available and you go out there and you spend the extra 10 15 million dollars not the 400 million dollars we've seen in these contracts it's things like that the revitalization of a minor league system camps in the dominican republic it's things like that to me that an owner who wants to spend in different areas can really improve a club yeah you want to go out and get the best free agents if they fit your team and the player is perfect for you in the offseason but there's so many other things an owner with deep pockets can help an organization with uh and how about you know picking a jt rail muto instead of a wilson ramos going out and oh making it right well, i'm just saying i mean yeah, to your I point know that, that keeping a michael please. conforto going forward um right. i mean you know there's there's a lot of examples of it that have happened and can happen so you're right i did misspeak i was talking more about the players wanting him you're right the owners have to vote him in but i do think this will happen and i think this is going to be a really good future now for the mets based on everything that you just brought up you've got a guy that a loves the team i mean that has not been written about enough i mean the fact that he grew up a met fan he's been a minor very small but a minority owner of this club already and um, it's exciting. If you're a Met fan, I think these are very exciting times. Now, the play on the field is one thing. This is yeah. completely other going forward. And, you know, it's going to happen quickly because the Wilpons, I believe, as we've discussed this, 
need out by the end of the year. So he will be the owner for the 2021 season and for the majority and bulk of the winter. So things are going to happen, I would think, relatively quickly. Yeah, and I've said it many times leading up to this moment that if you could craft an owner, if you could whittle an owner out of wood, it would be Steve Cohen. Right. It's the it's the perfect guy. You know, someone who's passionate about the team, someone with deep pockets. You know, I, I really hope that there isn't some sort of the other owner saying, oh, now we got two New York teams operating like the Yankees. We can't have that. Stop. I mean, this is – you cannot stop somebody – from owning a team if he has the highest bid. That, to me, is ridiculous. I mean, and to think that he's just going to come in and, and sign a bunch of losers for record deals, that's not going to happen either. I mean, people think that, oh, now he's going to go out there and sign the worst free agents for $25 million a year. No, he's not. I mean, he might outbid the Dodgers on somebody at some point. He might be in the mix on a player that the Mets haven't been in the mix on in years and years. Uh, but I don't think he's going to go out there and sign a bunch of schmucks to record deals and then screw up the market for everybody else. At least I hope not. There, you, uh, so You know, yeah. gee, there are so many examples of bad signings and bad contracts. I mean, just look at the Angels who have spent a fortune, and they don't get it right, and they never win. And then you got a team like the Rays that really spend on nothing, except maybe their minor league system, I guess, because it seems like they got players coming to the pipeline. It doesn't matter yeah. who they put out there. They always seem to win uh, a lot of games. It really is... The way you spend the money, um, and when you need to spend it, spending it the right way, and being able to go out and, as you point out, keep a Zach Wheeler, go out and get a real Muto if that's indeed the guy that you uh, decide you want. It's going to be able to keeping a Michael Conforto and not letting him walk away because he's going to cost too much money. But just, I've always said this: just spending the money does not make you a winner. It just doesn't. It's got to be spent the right way on the right players for the right team. So here's the thing I'm most interested in if the Steve Cohen thing continues to go in the way that we hope and he's the new owner. You know, we always talk about how some organizations just are, can never get out of their own way, and it stinks from the top. You know, whether it's the Jets or the Mets locally or the Knicks, it's just they can never get out of it. It's got to be the ownership. It's the ownership. The Redskins is the ownership. The Washington football team is the ownership. So will that stuff change with Steve Cohen? <laughs> like, will this, you know, the Cespedes story, Jeff uh, Wilpon and getting crushed by Brody Van Wagen and on a that open was, mic situation. That was something last week. <laughs> I mean, like, is that stuff going to change? You know, I mean, those are the things that I, I want to know. If you get a new owner in, is a franchise just cursed? Uh, like CeeLo Zoom camera that I look at it's like a freaking... <laughs> paranormal activity uh, or are we going to see some of the same stuff that that's the stuff that i'm always curious about you know it's a, it's a hard one to answer because it's not like this team hasn't had good times they have i mean yeah. in 2015 they went to the world series they won the national league pennant they weren't a disaster all year now part of that was cespedes and we know that but they've been good they've been to the playoffs but yes yeah, some of the stuff that happens off the field you know, and it's not just the owner. I mean, Cespit is falling in a hole and get, and chasing yeah. a wild boar or whatever the hell that story was. I mean, right. sometimes these things just happen. Hot mics happen. Of course, it happens to the Mets. Why not? Um, you know, the Jets are, are a team, too. What's, what's Joe's line? You can change the shirts. You yeah, can change, change the, the uniforms. Jersey, right? You can change the stadium. <laughs> yeah, you can change the coach. You know, they had times, too, when Parcells was here. Then you can say they were snake bitten with the injury to Testaverde. Um I'm going to say no. I'm going to say things absolutely can change and change quickly. This team has had good times, but they have a lot of bad ones. Uh, and you would think top down, if the right owner is in, he makes the right changes. I know you and Boomer seem to think that it's going to be a complete clean sweep of the front office. I would think just by doing be. that, assuming that, again, to me, and I said this to Boomer, I've said this to you, I don't know the relationships he has. I don't know if it's a partial cleaning. I mean, clearly there'll be changes. I don't think that's – I'm not uh, breaking any news there. Um, but you would think just with a completely new face at the top, and Will has been here a long time, that things would change just because. Um, but then again, who knows? If you believe in curses, I mean, they just haven't won in 50-something years. So who then? I don't know. Who will say? Yeah. I, I, I like Brody. I've always sort of – I didn't like the hire at the time because I remember saying that I wanted the baseball guy in High and Bloom. That's the person yep. I was rooting for. But then I got to know him a little bit, and he was fun. And I, I like that he was bold with things and tried to be creative, but there's been so many things that haven't worked out. And it's just, if you're Steve Cohen, you come into this situation, I don't know how 
you can continue to have him be the general manager. And example A is Edwin Diaz. And I don't care no. how many I know. tantalizing performances he will give you every now and then. He is someone that you cannot count on any longer in a high leverage situation. That's just the way it has to be. I'm sorry. Like you can Luis Rojas and Mickey Callaway before him and whoever the hell else who has had his back through all of this. Well, look how good he was here. His stuff is so electric and you know there was a he struck out the side in his last outing. I mean, look how great. It doesn't matter because there's always going to be a disaster on the other side. Now, not like a regular closer where it happens once in a blue moon who's supposed to be a great closer like he was in Seattle that one year. I mean, it's right around the corner. Like, if you get him in a game and he looks good, the next outing he's going. there's going to be a meltdown. And I was trying to think, because the Mets have had a long history of these guys, whether it be Mel Rojas or Billy Wagner or Armando Benitez, just... You know, I love John Franco, but John Franco used to live on the edge all the time. People used to couldn't stand when John Franco would come into games and walk the bases loaded and somehow find his way out of it. But he has got to be, Edwin Diaz has to be the most frustrating and annoying of all those guys. And I know that this is happening right in front of our face. Mel Rojas actually could have been worse. Mel Rojas, I remember him being just absolutely putrid. But with, with what the whole deal entailed, with Edwin Diaz, and needing him to be great, he has to be the most frustrating out of all of those guys. Like, I, I remember Benitez being great and having that great regular season. I understand there were meltdowns, but I remember him being great. I remember Billy Wagner at times being great. But this is just, I mean, K-Rod was a disaster, too, there for a while. He was another one. But there's just, Edwin Diaz, to me, is... Is got to be the it has he has to be the worst out of all these guys. He has to be. no argument at all. Now Friday night was one of those games where you saw what he was in Seattle. I mean swings and misses, the balls moving all over the place. I thought he had good command of the strike zone. He was into it. You could see the energy. Yesterday's an interesting one and terrible, 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 terrible. As we yeah. always play that clip and predictable too. I totally agree with you. It's funny because I I was watching the game, and I was watching on SNY, and Gary and and, and Keith, they were talking about how they're really trying to hold him for the night game. And, you know, my thought is I know it was 7-2, and I know that um, uh, Jimenez makes the error to start. I know they could have had the the guy out at third. He drops the ball. Not an easy play, but still it's an out at the major league level. Got to hold on to the ball. And he's he's number one, villain number one for that inning happening is is, um, Jimenez. No question about it. I would have started him in the last inning. It was a five-run lead, and here's why. He was tremendous on Friday night. You've got a five-run lead. You look at who was coming up. I would have thrown him out there, a fresh, clean inning. Even if he falters with one bad pitch, you're not going to get killed. And all of a sudden, you might have a couple of good outings back-to-back-to-back, to back to back, perhaps. But to put him in that spot when he wasn't ready, he wasn't up, he wasn't loose, and then to come in and say, sure, okay, now go get Aaron Hicks. It was as predictable as anything I've ever oh, you seen. you knew it. Right. Yes. Yeah, no, you're right. And you're watching the game. You're watching that game unfold. And first of all, you could tell Hughes was hideous from the sure. first at bat, even though he got the ground ball. I know that. He was all over the place, though. I, I, wish it, I don't know. It was one of those games that you sat there and said five runs, eh, but it just didn't seem safe, as crazy as that sounds. And for the Yankees, give them all the credit in the world. They never quit on that game down 7-2. And, oh, by the way, up seven runs, swing 3-0. They're professionals. If you haven't noticed, this stuff can happen. Um, but, yeah, I, it just I would not have put him there. I would have started him in the inning because at that point you win the series. You've taken three of four. Now go get the fifth game. You know, and you got to figure it out with someone it's, else at the end. But Yeah, know. it's definitely mismanagement by Rojas. And the, the thing that's the most infuriating about it is you should know at this point that bringing in Edwin Diaz in that type of situation is not going to work. You should the body of work. This is not a guy you can just call the bullpen phone and be like, "All right, let's go get him. Let's shut this thing down." You know, this isn't Trevor Hoffman out there. This isn't Mariano Rivera out there. You can't just be like, "All right, we got to get this done. We're going Edwin Diaz." Dun 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 dun. Here he comes out of the bullpen. You can't put him into a situation like that. You have to know that these guys they just insist on being tantalized 
by what he can do, and it's fresh in their memory, as you mentioned, from Friday, and then all of a sudden this is what you got. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I agree. I mean, Luis Rojas has a lot to deal with. He's a lot of responsibility in how that game even with some of the stuff that we talked about and the bad luck and not making plays and all this stuff. But he is, he's got to take a, a brunt of the responsibility for what happened in that meltdown for sure. Yeah, I, I agree. So it, it was a lost opportunity because you'd feel a lot different had they won that game 7-2 or 7-3. And then, okay, they lose last night, so be it. Gary Sanchez with the with the big home run. At least you'd walk away and say, you know what? They went three and two. They've got Steve Cohen on the horizon. Now go get the Marlins today with DeGrom. And it's amazing right. the difference of that meltdown, how the feeling can change. And then you know what? They're down one nothing. Garcia was really good. You get the base hit from Dominic Smith. And it's weird about Sanchez. It, I, I know he's batting a buck ten or about whatever, 135, 148. He's been terrible. I mean, he's a strikeout waiting to happen. He had his issues behind the plate again yesterday. Some not his fault, some his fault. But anytime he's got a bat in his hand, I don't know why. I feel like he's, you know, he's always going to hit a home run. And they're few and far between. But yesterday was a big one for that team. Because remember, going into Saturday, I think it was a seven-game losing streak. They were on the verge of making oh, yeah. eight out of nine. And then instead, they wound up taking the last three. So really, a lot of credit to the Yankees, who might have righted the ship with their last three games in the series. Oh, yeah. A complete turnaround in a couple of days. And you get Davey Garcia looking great yeah. yesterday. And his his demeanor for a 21-year-old, and I understand there's no fans in the stands and whatever, but, I mean, my God, he was as calm as you could be for someone in that type of situation. Just the way he looked, the way he pitched, he was in command. It's everything you wanted to see from a young pitcher. So they got to feel great about themselves now as they continue to try to get healthy. But, yeah, they they were on the brink, and then that was one of those moments where they come back in, well, of course, they win on Saturday as well, but you know, they come back in that game, the first game of the doubleheader yesterday, and then they win the second one. They feel phenomenal about themselves, a three-game winning streak when they, you're right, they were on the brink of sliding completely off the mountain. And his, uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is Dennis Green would say, yeah, let him off the hook. <laughs> and they <laughs> yeah, did. Yeah, man. My and guy, they did. My guy, Dennis Green. By the way, real uh, all quick, right, it is how about your boy Robinson yeah, Cano? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I understand. I mean, <laughs> and by the, uh, speaking of that, Clint Frazier cutting that oh, ball off in the I gap mean, yesterday. Tremendous play. Tremendous. Yeah, I mean, Robinson Cano still would have been at first, but. Not true. He did. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I figured it was uh, yeah, on the I know, broadcast. Everybody. The like, ball would have gone to the wall. Yeah. <laughs> <Was> it <laughs> but Michael? it's just funny. That's the first thing I thought of. The ball would have gone right to the wall, and then it was like, wait a second. No, he would have still been at first base. I was back and forth. I forget which one, who said it, but one of them was like, you know, when was the last time you saw an outfielder dive for a ball? to stop an extra base hit. Not just a single or a diving yeah. catch for an out. Like, that stops a double. I really it was a tremendous. He is a, he's a good player. God, he's a good player. Yeah. You know, the more we're seeing of and him. He, it, and defensively, he's been called into question many times, and he really hasn't shown any real deficiencies no. there uh, this season so far. So that's great that he's been able to improve on that as well. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the red bell so you're notified when we have new content.